Good afternoon. My name is Laura Brown, and I'm an historian at the Canadian War Museum. And I'm very pleased to act as your host today. Today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and we are humbled to have the opportunity to speak with Holocaust survivor Andy Reti as he shares his story with all of us. I'm speaking to you this afternoon from the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. Before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge that the, our museum is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge your traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. I would like to start with a brief orientation to our Zoom webinar features. Today's presentation will be recorded. You will be able to access the recording after the event by visiting the Canadian War Museum's YouTube channel. Today's presentation will be recorded. You'll be able to view it on the Canadian War Museum's YouTube channel. Today's event is presented in English with simultaneous translation into French. To start simultaneous interpretation, click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and then choose the French version. You can adjust the volume and the translation option to your liking. Finally, before we begin the event, I would like to note that Andy volunteers his time and his personal experience of the Holocaust, or time to share his personal experience of the Holocaust with all of us. And this can be emotionally difficult. Even though we cannot see one another, I trust that we are all joined together in the spirit of tolerance, openness, and learning. Please ensure all questions are thoughtful and in that spirit. This event was made possible because of our partnership with the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies. I would now like to pass the virtual microphone to Elena Kingsbury, who will tell you a bit more about their incredible organization and introduce you to today's guest of honor, Andy Veti. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Elena and I am an educator with the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies. We're thrilled to be partnering today with the Canadian War Museum to bring you a conversation between historian Laura and uh, Holocaust survivor Andy Reti in honor of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We do so in our effort to uphold the mission of Holocaust survivor and post-war Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal, the man our organization is named after. Simon spent more than 50 years pursuing justice for victims of the Holocaust. He is best known for his role in bringing infamous Nazi war criminals to trial. Um, but Simon also recognized that education is a critical component of justice and key to preventing similar atrocities in the future. Before I turn it over to Laura and Andy, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce you to Andy's story and to provide a little bit of context for the conversation that will follow. Andy uh, was born during the Holocaust itself in the year 1942 in Budapest, which is Hungary's capital city. He survived the Holocaust as a very young child in the Budapest ghetto. As with other ghettos, a section of Budapest was completely cut off from the outside world. No food was allowed in, rubbish and waste were not collected, and the dead lay on the ground um, with overcrowded buildings and uh, a disease environment where typhoid and other illnesses could thrive. More than half of those that were forced into the ghetto in 1944 were ultimately sent onto concentration camps. And this began almost immediately after the ghetto was established. Andy survived due to the heroism of his mother and grandmother and arguably a good deal of luck. This ghetto and other ghettos across Nazi occupied and allied territories um, were built to separate and isolate Jews from the broader public in urban centers. This was a critical stage in the progression of the Holocaust. It was from ghettos, including the one in Budapest, that many Jews were subsequently deported to their deaths in concentration camps. But ghettos were places of anti-Semitic persecution in their own right, places of inhuman brutality with overcrowding, violence, starvation, and infestation, where thousands of victims died as a result of far reaching Nazi policies. In sharing Andy's story of survival, we hope to expand our collective understanding of the Holocaust and honor the millions of victims who did not survive, 
as well as survivors like Andy who continue to share their knowledge with us today. I will now turn it back over to Laura and Andy and um, please remember to type any questions that you have into the chat box. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elena. So, hi, Andy. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So, Andy, we see a presentation in front of us, and the title of your presentation is The Ring of Love. So, why do you call your story The Ring of Love? The Ring of Love actually is one part of the entire story because I am a young child Holocaust survivor and this ring was hidden by my mother during the Holocaust. But because I was also a speaker and a docent at the Holocaust Museum, I had the opportunity to hear many other survivor story. And I came with the conclusion that every Holocaust survivor story is a love story. It's love of life, love of family, and love of freedom. And this is a personal piece of artifact, an eyewitness to history, because this ring has an incredible story that I'll tell you in a few minutes. Great. I look forward to hearing more about the ring. It's a, a really powerful piece of material culture. So Andy, you were a child in the Holocaust. You were very young. What makes your perspective unique as a child Holocaust survivor? And how is your story also your mother's story? Well, actually it is mostly my mother's story, partially my story. And I've been doing this now for the 23rd year. And I do tell my audience that the story you're about to hear is my mother's story, but because I was there with her, it's mine as well. And I heard her talk about this. I heard my grandmother talk about it. And of course, I heard other people talk about it. The unique perspective is the fact that I grew up with this overwhelming sensation coming from my mother time after time that I hate injustice. And the fact that there is no greater injustice that I had to grow up without a father because he was a Jew. And I was actually slated to be murdered because I was a son of a Jew. So that is my unique perspective. And of course, how I grew up in Canada, having the Holocaust as a background. Mm -hmm. Now, Andy, could you tell me a bit about what life was like for your family during the Holocaust? Well, of course, we have to go back just a little bit before the Holocaust and paint a bit of a background that my mother and father got married in 1939, which of course is the breakout of the Second World War, and they were both very poor. They came from poor families. My mother was one of five sisters. My father was an only child. And the fact is that they were actually forced to live with my paternal grandparents because they didn't have a home of their own. They couldn't afford it. So we were poor before the war. We were poor during the war. And we continued to be poor after the war. So we come from a rather modest background. Material possessions was not a big part of our life. My paternal grandparents uh, lived in a capital city of uh, Page. And my paternal grandparents lived in the capital of Hungary, uh, Budapest. They were all poor working people. During the Holocaust, when we were taken to the ghetto, we continued living a very modest life, but our big preoccupation was food. That was the overwhelming occupation, uh, preoccupation for everybody to get enough food. 
Yeah, it, in some ways it came down to this, the bare necessities, um, food, hunger, being such prominent parts of your life. Indeed, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And Andy, we mentioned earlier, you were very young during the Holocaust as it was going on. You mentioned also life in the ghetto. What are your memories from this time, from life in the ghetto? Uh, very interesting that I actually have two personal recollection and this is one of them, the picture you're showing right now of my little friend, Katie. And I actually named my own daughter after her. Katie was a few months older than I was and her mother and my mother was best friends. And years later, I found out that our fathers were together in the same uh, unit uh, in the forced labor battalion. And my personal recollection of the fact that oh, Katie and I were sleeping on a fold out Chesterfield with the two mothers on the outside, the two babies between the mothers touching their feet. And my little friend Katie had the coldest feet in the universe. So that's my personal recollection. Or at least one of them. I have one more, but uh -huh. I guess we'll get to that later. Okay, if you'd like to speak about it later. Um, maybe before we go into what life was like after um, the liberation, could you tell me a bit more about what life was like in the ghetto? Was it very contained? Was there information flowing in and out? Uh, because we lived in the capital of Budapest, uh, the Hungarian Jews were the last European uh, uh, community to be intact up until spring and summer of 1944. Hungary was an ally of Germany and because we lived in the capital of Budapest, we were the last ones to be rounded up. The uh, uh, regent or governor of Hungary by the name of Admiral Horthy was pushed out of power in October of 1944 by the Hungarian fascist uh, uh, German, uh, Hungarian fascist party. And that is when our Shoah, which is my preference for the word Holocaust, meaning suffering started. And life in the ghetto at the beginning was not as horrible as it was towards the end. Originally, the life in the ghetto uh, didn't have a curve, but had a very, uh, uh, limited curfew, there was a curfew. And then later on the curfew was revoked and liberties were taken away. And eventually uh, the gates of the ghetto were shut, nobody in, nobody out. And the only provision of food was what we originally had with us and it was dwindling. In the end, it was less and less and less. There was very little food left. That was the overwhelming desire to survive. You needed food and water. So we were fortunate that we had a running water and we had a wood burning stove, but the food was diminishing daily. So we had a very, very hard time surviving in the ghetto. Mm -hmm. And then you were liberated in early 1945. Um, what was life like for your family following this liberation? Well, uh, my mother and grandmother and I were together in the ghetto. Both my father and grandfather were taken away to the Hungarian uh, forced labor battalion, part of the Hungarian army. They were not allowed to uh, bear weapons, but they were made to uh, doing menial tasks. So we survived the ghetto, the three of us together. On December 25, somehow my father was able to escape his labor battalion. He was able to find us. He was able to sneak in, which was tremendous relief, but bringing one huge problem, one more mouth to feed. By that time, we had very little food. And my grandmother 
had a little bit of a container with flour, actually dust. And she was able to make a tiny, tiny uh, biscuit, no bigger than the palm of my hand. And she wouldn't allow my grandfather food. She wouldn't take a bite herself. And when my mother begged her to eat, she said, I can't. What am I going to tell my son? Oh, I took care of you. So this is a sacrifice that only a mother can make. No man is capable of this kind of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. What an incredible story that that sacrifice um, that she was willing to do that for another family member. That's really powerful. Andy, a few years later, um, you and your mother moved to Canada, which is a whole another chapter of your life. But with this move, you still, of course, brought many memories with you. How did the Holocaust shape your life as a Canadian? Oh, so many ways. I really and truly had no idea how much the Holocaust was a part of my persona until I wrote a sequel to my mother's book. Now, my mother is an eyewitness to the Holocaust. I am merely a survivor, but I am a survivor because of my mother's and grandmother's incredible sacrifices. My mother wrote a book called An Ordinary Woman in Extraordinary Times. And this was used at York University for 10 years as text. She was still alive when I was able to write a sequel to it called The Son of an Extraordinary Woman. And until I was writing this book, I had no idea how my entire life was shaped because of the Holocaust. I had no idea why I do those crazy things as my mother used to call, because I was fearless. I did not take a backward step to anybody. I hate injustice and I learned that from my mother. And if you think about it, is there another greater injustice than to be murdered because you're a Jew? And this really and truly is part of my life. To this day, I fight for justice. I speak up against injustice. So the Holocaust had shaped my life in so many different ways. And Andy, do you mind if I ask you a little bit about your father? Um, he, he died in the Holocaust. Did you know when you were young what happened to him and and what his story was at the end of his life? Or is this something that you learned about much later? I was told all my life that he died of typhus. And somehow I could not relate to that. I could not accept the fact that that strapping young man, five foot ten, 31 years old in the prime of his life, would succumb to such an ugly disease as typhus. Much, much later did I find out the truth behind it, but we didn't know it. My mother didn't know. My grandmother didn't know. Now, this is the first time we've gone back to Hungary to visit the cemetery where he's commemorated. The entrance to the cemetery says, hatred had killed them, may love cherish their memory. And it is so appropriate because I found out at my son's bar mitzvah the true story of his murder and the true story that he died because he loved. And I can tell you the incredible pride that the Israeli Foundation combined the two books into one called Stronger Together. And they have a picture that they found in his wallet. And for years, for years, I had a tough time making kind of a semblance that he died because he loved. At my son's bar mitzvah, there was a cousin who came from Israel, and turns out that they they first cousins. They were together, and cousin Harry wanted my father to escape with him. And my father said, Harry, you have no family. <clears throat> if I get caught, 
will be shot. You have no family, you got nothing to risk. But I have Amy, Ibby and Emil, Ibby and Andy waiting for me. I can't take that chance that will be shot. Harry only got about 200 yards when he heard the brutal machine gun. 29 young people, husbands, fathers, sons, brutally murdered. Even though the war was lost, the hatred was so deep that they were still murdering Jews just because they could. So for me to find out on the day of my son's bar mitzvah, the true story, it took me a long time to process that he died because he loved. This was a very hard concept, but in the end, it became part of me. It became who I am. It became what my mother taught me. And it is something that I'm trying to teach my children and grandchildren that love is stronger than hate. Thank you, Andy, for, for sharing that information about your father. I know that must be challenging to talk about, um, but it's such a powerful message, that message of love that comes out of that story. So thank you. You had just shown a few moments ago your mother's book. And I want to explore a little bit um, your work in Holocaust education. Now, I understand that you have a special hobby that you're really passionate about, that you've been able to fuse with your dedication to Holocaust education. How does that work? Well, uh, it goes back to my background again about the Holocaust. I am a biker because of my mother and the Holocaust. My mother at age six allowed me to ride a full-size motorcycle, which was an incredible <laughs> courage for a mother to allow a child to go on a motorcycle. In fact, when the carnival men saw that I was begging and cajoling my mother, my mother said to him, his feet don't even reach the ground. And the carnival said, don't worry, he is on it and will tell him when to pull the brake and will get him off. So my mother said, his feet don't reach the ground. Some of my friends say nothing has changed in 70 years. It still doesn't. But she allowed me to go on a motorcycle. Imagine. So that came with me. And that was part of my wish all my life to have a motorcycle. At age 17, I had uh, together with my best friend who lives in Montreal, we put together a bike. And at age 60, I got my first ever brand new bike. So bike is to me the greatest symbol of freedom. Motorcycle is something that you cannot experience without the feeling of freedom. To me, a motorcycle equates freedom to go up the hill, to come down the hill, to lean into a curve, to come out and look at the scenery. It is just an incredible freedom. In fact, I heard many, many Holocaust survivor story and everybody has a different uh, description of freedom. To me, this is freedom. So I include that in all my presentations. And in 2005, I joined a motorcycle comp uh, uh, club called Yows. This was the symbol of the Yows. Y O W, Yow, Yidden on Wheels, Jews on Wheels. And we rode to the Washington Holocaust Museum. And I have been uh, doing uh, Holocaust presentations ever since when I include the motorcycle equating freedom. That's fantastic, Andy. Um, staying with the theme of education, we have a lot of people tuning in today, especially a lot of students. What's the, the message that you have for students today? Education is the key to everything. I do a lot of presentations and I, I, and I really like to interact with my audience. And quite often I will say, so how many of you told your parents that I hate you? Come on, put those hands up. We all said it at one time. But do you mean it? No. 
No, we just say it because sometimes we just don't get what we want. Oh, I hate you for not getting that $150 sneaker or that new video game. But you really don't hate your parents, do you? So education is the key because sometimes hate is the fear of the unknown. Why do we hate spinach? Well, you never tasted it. Why do you hate it? Well, I don't know it. So love, education, hate, these are strong emotions. And I try to combine it and fuse it into my presentations. And Andy, we see a pledge on the screen here. Would you like to speak to us about this pledge? Yes, I would. But if you'd be kind enough to go back to the previous picture where I am on. Thank you. This is the R2R. Right to remember when it came to Canada for the first time in 2012. And I had the privilege of reciting the pledge in front of hundreds and subsequently thousands of people. And this is what the pledge states. My name is Andy Reiti, a young child Holocaust survivor and a member of the Yao Motorcycle Club of Toronto. Less than 70 years ago, the world of 6 million Jewish people, including my own father, came to an end in an act that is so evil that the only word that can describe it is Holocaust. I stand before you as a witness and a free man to tell all Never again, never again to any and all genocides, never again to racial hatred, never again to a second Holocaust. Please take this pledge by repeating it with me and please stand up. We pledge to speak up against hatred and racism. We pledge to remember. Please put your hand over your heart and say, we pledge never again. Thanks for that, Andy. Those are some great words to carry us all forward and to remember. I appreciate you sharing that. Andy, I'm going to flip the microphone over to Elena, who will take us to the, the subsequent part of our program. But I just want to say it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thanks so much. Thank you for helping to honor my mother and the six million brothers and sisters. This is a very special day. And this is a very special, special museum that you represent. So I thank you. Thanks kindly. <clears throat> Absolutely. And thank you so much, Laura and Andy, for that really insightful conversation. I think, um, you know, I learned something new from your story each time I hear it. And, and uh, I hope I hear it many, many more times. Um, one quick question I had just before we take a quick look at your book, which I think probably a lot of members of our audience would like to know more about. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe share a small excerpt from the book. Um, I know your mother wrote a poem and this poem actually kind of speaks to your first memory of, um, of, of uh, that moment of freedom in a way, which is such an important theme of your presentation today. Do you mind sharing that with us? Absolutely. As I said, this helps to honor my mother because my mother captured my experience with her beautiful words. She composed this poem titled, Hunger. Mommy, mommy, please give me a little piece of bread. I am hungry, very hungry. Just this little mommy. My two-year-old son puts his two tiny fingers together, showing me just how little he wanted. Tomorrow, my son, tomorrow, maybe the war will be over and you will have all the bread you want. Hush, hush, little one. Go to sleep, don't cry. Mommy will hold you and sing you a lullaby. The next day comes and goes, but no food, only hopes. Hopes that tomorrow we could be free. The following morning, indeed, we hear noises. 
different voices. We all rush to the courtyard and there he is, a Russian soldier who just liberated us. I beg him with sign language, with tears running on my cheek, please give me some bread. My baby is starving to death. The soldier reaches into his pocket and puts a roll in my hand. As I give it to my child, he looks at it with wide, unbelieving eyes, then crying and laughing and jumping with joy. He bites into the soft, beautiful white roll. It was dark. Russians have dark bread, not white. My mother just took a little poetic license to make it rhyme. So that is my actual second personal recollection of the Holocaust. Wow. So I remember liberation and that moment of, you know, especially for a child and, you know, starvation being such a, a presence in your life, that, that liberation really did come in the form of a role. So that's, that's such a, an incredible memory to have. Um, and I think the last thing I just wanted to ask you about, Andy, is where we can actually get a copy of your book. Um, I'll just put up a picture of, of the book itself. But where can we get a copy today if we'd like to learn more about your story? Well, the Israeli uh, Foundation is the publisher of my Holocaust uh, memoir. But in fact, they have published well over 70 other survivors' memoirs. And it is available at Amazon and Second Story Press. So uh, I think that if people contact the Wiesenthal Center or perhaps even the Ottawa War Museum, this could be supplied to them, the information. Absolutely. We can, we can certainly pass that information along. And with, with that said, I think our program has drawn to a conclusion. Thank you so much for everyone joining us today. You have truly helped uh, to commemorate the um, you know, International Holocaust Remembrance Day and the people that we, that we recognize and remember on this date. So have a wonderful afternoon and thank you for listening to today. Thank you. And I would just like to add um, on behalf of the Canadian War Museum, big thank you to Elena and the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies. It's been a pleasure to partner with you for this event. Thank you to our audience, our listeners. Wonderful to have you tune in. And again, a big thank you to Andy. It's been a privilege to hear your story. Thanks so much.